Hello and welcome to today's Monday Night Lecture. My name is Dr Rachel Squire uh, and I'm a lecturer in Human Geography here in the Department of Geography at Royal Holloway. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening as part of our school's uh, lecture series and hopefully over the next 20 minutes or so I can add to what is already a wonderful library uh, online exploring all kinds of different geographical themes, concepts and ideas. Now over the next 20 minutes we're going to be delving into uh, a space that maybe has been neglected a bit in geography and that is of course the ocean. We often think of, of geography as being about processes on land and uh, within the next few slides we're going to be exploring how the ocean, how the processes that take place upon it and through it are actually really fundamental to our everyday lives and to our wider geographical imaginations as well. So the lectures are kind of divided into to three parts really. In the first few minutes we're going to be exploring why we should think about the sea at all as a geographical space and within that introducing shipping as a key process within wider themes around globalization, trade and the flows of movements, uh, flows of, of, of goods and the movement of goods as well. We're then going to think about the sea as a place of people. Of course shipping, whilst we may not give it too much thought, isn't a disembodied process and people are absolutely fundamental uh, to underpinning uh, the global economy and uh, the global movement of goods through the sea. So we're going to be exploring some of the human geographies of that process through the actors of seafarers. And then I'll just offer some really brief conclusions uh, at the end. So firstly, why think about the sea as a geographical space? You may or, or may not know that the root word of geography is earth writing. And often in geographical research, or at least in the past, earth was kind of conceptualized very literally to mean land, to mean the landed spaces upon which we live our lives. And as geographers, I guarantee probably in every geography classroom, uh, you will have a map like the one on this slide. We're used to seeing the land in these kind of colorful blocks that seem uh, animated by borders, uh, by different kind of colors dividing them by different geographical features. But when it comes to the ocean, we see this blank blue space that seems not to have much character. There might be a, a kind of few labels on it, but compared to the land masses, it seems like a space that is almost blank, uh, that doesn't seem uh, to have a geography. And it's probably maps like this that have contributed uh, to what some geographical scholars and also popular writers as well have called sea blindness. So maybe we have a lack of awareness of the central role that the sea plays in the social, cultural, economic and political geographies of our world. And I think it's really important that we address this because the sea is absolutely fundamental to our everyday lives. 72% of the Earth's surface consists of bodies of water, the majority of which consists of the sea. Now, if we go back to that map, you can see that that blue space is vast. It, it constitutes the majority of our planet. So if we have, as geographers are interested in this process of writing the planet, of exploring the planet, of exploring Earth, then the sea needs to be a, a really central component of that. Secondly, take a breath. If you were to take a breath in and out right now, as I have just done, then 80% of the oxygen that you just breathed in comes from plankton found drifting in the ocean through a process of photosynthesis. Now we often think about rainforests as being the kind of lungs and the powerhouses of the earth, but actually the ocean plays a really vital role here too. And then we can think of a whole range uh, of other processes, whether that be people's livelihoods that are entangled with the ocean, food and nutrition. So a wonderful geographer called Elspeth Probren talks about how we all eat the ocean whether we eat fish and chips um, at the weekend, or whether we eat fruit and vegetables that are grown with fertilizers that are made up of ground fish matter, we all eat and interact with the ocean in ways that we don't often think about. We could think about governance, climate change, the health of our planet. There's all kinds of issues we could be thinking about here in relation to the sea. But as is the focus of the next 20 minutes or so, it's also central to processes of globalization and the global economy. So 90 to 96% of trade on average uh, is carried over the ocean. So if you were to look around uh, whichever room that you're sitting in now, 
90 to 96 percent of the trade of the goods and products and commodities within that room will have come to you through the ocean so our everyday lives are really intimately connected with this vast space that is often beyond our sight and often beyond our imaginations unless we live uh, by the sea so something when we think about the ocean in this way it doesn't become this kind of blank blue uh, space now this map is a map of, of kind of shipping all around the world and you can see that every line there every color colored line represents a shipping route and the journey of a particular shipping vessel now suddenly on this map the ocean is enlivened it comes alive with different kind of processes whether that be trade underpinning the processes of globalization and of course thinking about how all those goods that we're sitting uh, surrounded by right now um, have reached us this is far from being a blank environment without any geographies and as the international chamber of shipping uh, highlight the shipping industry and particularly container shipping so the shipping of um, shipping containers those kind of lego like blocks that we see moving around motorways uh, on trains and on ships these are the lifeblood of the global economy and without this process intercontinental trade the transport of raw materials the import and export of affordable food and goods would simply not be possible the ocean is absolutely fundamental to this process and due to kind of growing economic liberalization and also drives for increasing efficiency within shipping so to make it quicker to make it smoother um, and to keep kind of goods moving as quickly as possible this industry continues to expand and it's going to become increasingly important um, as well in the years to come and the scale of the operation is worth noting too so there are around 50,000 ships trading internationally transporting every kind of cargo that you can imagine now this world fleet the fleet of the the, the different ships that kind of constitute this 50,000 are registered in over 150 countries so it's a global industry and crewed by over a million seafarers of virtually every nationality this is something that's taking place on an enormous scale and we can see that in some of the pictures of uh, shipping uh, container ships Maersk is, is one of the kind of industry leaders and you can just see how enormous these vessels are they weigh hundreds of thousands of tons sometimes and some of Maersk vessels can can transport up to 20,000 shipping containers those lego like uh, blocks that you can see piled up uh, on board that ship again slightly pixelated image so apologies for that but the scale of this operation compared to uh, that lone seafarer standing amidst all those shipping containers um, is, is plain to see it's a big industry and it's one that sometimes we don't often think about how often do we think about where everything that we buy in the supermarket for example has come from sometimes it takes moments of rupture or failure to bring these spaces and sites uh, and processes to our attention i probably don't need to remind you of the case study of the ever given uh, which ground to a halt uh, in the suez canal completely blocking uh, the suez canal preventing any other ships passing uh, through its waters again illustrating the scale of this the ever given weighed some 220,000 tons at the time that it got stuck it was carried around 18,300 containers and it pretty much held up global trade quite significantly for around six days in March and Lloyd's List estimated this to have cost around 9.6 billion uh, to the global economy as it held up over around 350 uh, container ships and other ships from continuing their journey through the canal now if we're thinking about uh, shipping is a lifeblood of the global economy the Suez Canal is one of the key arteries so around 12% of trade passes through there um, so if you block that it has knock-on consequences and really significant knock-on consequences as well from profits lost for big shipping companies to everyday consumers having goods held up or having price increases at the shops as a result of this process and there's lots of uh, speculation as to when consumers might feel the effects of the ever given blockage in terms of price rises in supermarkets um, and everyday contexts as well so shipping is really vital and fundamental to our everyday lives from the food we eat from the clothes we wear from the amazon deliveries that come through our letterbox 
All of these are intricately and intimately bound up in journeys that span and cross through uh, the ocean. The ocean being a vital space of trade, of commerce and of globalisation. But really importantly, as we're now going to come on to explore, it's also a place of people. So it was less widely reported in the case of the Ever Given that there was actually a 25 strong crew on board the ship. And for them, this situation would have caused all kinds of stresses from reports about potential liabilities that they may have faced uh, for the ship getting blocked, for concerns over how long they're going to be stuck for um, and what, you know, when they'll get to continue their journey uh, to disembark. All of those kinds of questions were really important and paramount to those living on board. Shipping is not a disembodied industry. And I think this is really important because often when we're thinking about trade or issues of globalization, or particularly questions around fair trade, we often think of this as a process that goes from A to B. So in the case of fair trade, we might think about uh, the producers of certain goods working under ethical conditions and fair conditions. And then we might think about point B, the consumer who can then buy into making more ethical choices based on seeing a logo of fair trade. But we often don't think about that middle space in between. Is it fair uh, to those who are moving those goods through the oceans? What are the, what are the labour conditions like uh, for those on board? How does this global economy intersect uh, with their everyday lives? And just to return uh, to this map briefly, if we're looking at all these colourful lines and all of these journeys being made, each one of those is a peopled process. Each one of those is underpinned by human labour and a human workforce. And I think that's really easy to forget when we read about kind of big statistics of global trade or the billions that have been lost in the global economy. We forget about the people side of this industry and the really important human geographies that animate this process. And seafarers are really at the heart of this. So to go back to the, to the lifeblood uh, analogy, if shipping is the lifeblood of globalisation and the global economy, then seafarers are really its beating heart. Without their labour and without this workforce, the global economy is simply ground to a halt. Our everyday lives would look radically different uh, as we wouldn't be able to consume uh, the goods that we do, that we do uh, on a daily basis. And this process is reliant on over 1.6 million seafarers serving on ships worldwide. The Philippines is the biggest supplier of seafarers in the world, followed by China, Indonesia, Russia and uh, Ukraine. And as I said, without them, the global supply chain would simply collapse. And this process that we often think of as disembodied or we just see those vast kind of container ship vessels moving through the sea is completely underpinned by uh, the people, by the seafarers making this possible. And in addition to kind of propping up uh, the global economy and processes of globalization, seafarers also have a significant impact on their home economies as well, sending money back to their families uh, in, the, in their home countries. I think there's some really important questions to consider here if we're thinking through the human geographies of this process and thinking through the sea as a space of lived experience and not just a blank empty space uh, to cross as quickly as possible. So what is the effect of the global supply chain on those who are responsible for keeping it moving? What are the consequences of the drive for efficiency and this kind of seamless process of circulation uh, and global uh, shipping? What are the consequences of that process on the on the people uh, that keep it moving and the people whose job it is to keep the global economy afloat? And I'm just going to outline three of those kind of entanglements over the next few minutes. And the first of these is is to do with the amount of time spent at sea. So if you're a seafarer, you'll often sign up for a contract on board a ship for anything from nine to 12 months and sometimes they can be longer than this and extended uh, beyond this time frame as well. Now really importantly the demands of the global economy and this drive for efficiency and to keep goods uh, kind of circulating as quickly as possible mean that shipping companies want to spend as little time as they can at a port so they want to unload uh, their cargo and reload with new cargo as quickly as possible and even those gigantic uh, ships that we saw 
uh, earlier on in the presentation, they can unload and reload within about 24 hours. Now this has really, I guess, profound consequences for the economy because if you're interested in efficiency and profit, then that speed and that quick turnaround and that constant movement is really important. But if you're a seafarer, that also has profound consequences because the economy and the demands of the economy and globalization keep the ship at sea for 93% of its journey. Now for shipping companies, that might be fantastic news. But again, if we're thinking about this as a people process, that also means that seafarers are at sea for 93% of their contract. Now that's an awfully long time to be spending in a relatively kind of contained uh, environment. Now these turnaround times have only become quicker as ships have become bigger because technology has improved and efficiency has improved, meaning that you can move things uh, on and off much more quickly. But this has really big consequences for those on board because they effectively uh, become tied to the ship to keep this process moving. And we can hear or see one of the uh, testimonies of, of a seafarer who contributed to a study by Kvechi. This was back in 1999, but efficiency has only got um, well greater uh, since then, and these problems certainly haven't gone away. Now, the seafarer describes it as a frantic life, living on a tight schedule, manoeuvrings any time, day or night, port stay only a few hours, no time ashore. So basically, because the ship is only spending a, a very short amount of time on shore, and because this is actually one of the busiest time for seafarers as well, facilitating that process, they don't actually get much time to go ashore um, and to enjoy being on land. This seafarer's contract was for four months, and he said during that time he made 56 port calls. So frequent manoeuvrings break your normal biorhythm. After four months spent like this, you're almost like a living zombie. He goes on to say that the difference between being in port and being at sea is negligible because you're not going to leave the ship in either place. So on the one hand, we have something that's very good in the minds of, of ship owners and in the minds of kind of people interested in profiting from this industry, a process that happens quickly, a process that happens very efficiently. But for those who are responsible for making it happen, this has profound implications for their everyday lives and for their working lives uh, as well. And the second uh, thing we might think about is actually the space of the ports themselves. Now you can imagine as kind of container ships have got bigger as they're carrying uh, more cargo, deeper waters are needed to support them and also larger spaces are needed on land to facilitate the offloading and processing of those that kind of vast amount uh, of cargo and those vast numbers of containers. If you can imagine you're unloading over 18,000 containers from a ship, you need a lot of space to do that. Now, as a result, ports have moved kind of further away from city centres and further away from the kind of main hubs of society. And as a result, the port comes to exist kind of outside of society. It's not a space that we really see. It's not a space that we can go visit. It's not a space where we really see um, any labour taking place, any work taking place, because it's simply not a space we encounter in our daily lives. The port itself, uh, says one geographer, has come to exist outside of society. It's no longer a kind of uh, a, a hub, a central space for people uh, to experience, but it's now a space where things are simply assembled, stored, moved from and to. And there's some really uh, compelling examples of this. So the top image that you can see there is of Yangshan Deepwater Port in Shanghai. Now this is a port that sits on an island 32 kilometres out at sea. You can imagine if you're a seafarer calling at a port and you only have a few hours to spend on shore, there's no way that you're going to go and experience Shanghai um, in this space because it is so far removed uh, from city centres and from places where seafarers would want to go to, uh, to visit. Now at the bottom there we have an example closer to home. So that is uh, London Gateway in Thorox, a relatively new port Again, the name implies that you know it's a gateway uh, to London. It's you know a stone's throw away, perhaps, from the city centre. Um, but as you can see from that image, it's it's far from that. Again, if you're a seafarer and you only have a very limited amount of time to spend at shore, to actually move beyond this port space is going to be quite difficult in that short amount of time. 
And this combination of kind of quick turnaround times and port locations being removed further from society, yes, it may facilitate that, that efficient process, that constant circulation uh, of goods, but again, has really profound human consequences. A different uh, seafarer in Kvetchi's study, for example, saying that you're literally like a prisoner on board. To go ashore, you really had to be superhuman because A, ports are further away from uh, society, turnaround times are increasing, and that time in port is one of the busiest times for seafarers anyway. And this is really important because actually shore spaces are one of the few spaces where seafarers can connect, whether virtually or socially uh, as well with each other and with people outside of their ship. Often there's no internet access on board, which I'll come on to in a second. And seafarer centres in port spaces are really important for people uh, to go and visit in order to connect virtually with their families, to, to have a break, I guess, from that shipbound experience. And finally, uh, the final kind of uh, entanglement that I just wanted uh, to talk about is this kind of shape and life aboard the ship itself. Now, as technology evolves and as this process of shipping becomes increasingly efficient, ships have become much emptier of people because simply it's much cheaper that way. It's much cheaper if you're a shipping company to have fewer crew on board. So the, the fewer amount of crew that you have, the cheaper your operation can be. And just to reiterate that example of the Ever Given, bearing in mind that this is a 200,000 tonne ship, it contains over 18,500 containers. The number of people running this and the number of people crewing this ship was only 25, which is relatively few. So the ships themselves have got increasingly big in size and increasingly empty of people, the Ever Given being a prime example of that. And the result of this is that a single person tasking across the ship is very common, that watch keeping shifts are often completed by one person. In other words, jobs that historically you might have done in a team or there might have been a group of people undertaking are now completed uh, by, by one person, often in kind of shift patterns. So you kind of overlap with uh, another seafarer. And this has all sorts of implications for thinking through questions of fatigue, loneliness, isolation and feelings of isolation being very common uh, amongst seafarers, um, particularly on longer voyages and on longer contracts. And as I said before, this is compounded by the issue of connectivity. So if you can't spend time on shore to use things like internet services on ships, you might not have the opportunity to do that. We assume perhaps today that everything is connected to Wi-Fi and internet access is everywhere. But on uh, shipping uh, vessels and across the shipping industry, actually connectivity is uh, a real problem. And it's something that not many ships um, have on board. And this amplifies all kinds of pressures, whether that be existing financial pressures, strains on family relationships because you're away for long periods of time and compounding that sense uh, of isolation as well. So if we're thinking about the global economy and that process of globalization and circulation, fewer people might make that more efficient. They might make that process cheaper, which might make goods cheaper for us to consume as consumers. Again, this has very profound human consequences for those on board. So we should really be thinking of seafarers as key to globalization, as key actors in globalization, and as key to the global economy. Now, they are fundamental to keeping these processes uh, afloat. And we need to think critically about the effects uh, of globalization and of the eff effects of this constant process of circulation on uh, people and thinking through really carefully the human geographies of this process. Because really what we're seeing here is an economy that drives a kind of set of relations that dictates what is able to move, so what products are able to move, what commodities are able to circulate quickly through the ocean, and who ends up getting kind of stuck and immobilised as a result of that process, almost circulating with those goods, although not disembarking on land as those products might do. So geographers have kind of described seafarers as being almost part of the ocean. They're embedded within this process in ways that we don't always think about and in ways that we don't always remember when we're in the supermarket because it is so far removed from our sight and our, and our gaze. And there's all kinds of further avenues to explore here if you're interested. 
you might be thinking about questions of abandonment, for example, which is problematically common within the shipping industry. So if a shipping company goes bust, for example, often seafarers are left to fend for themselves. They might literally end up being stuck uh, on board uh, a shipping vessel. Who is responsible for seafarers? Who is speaking out for them within these contexts? We might also think about uh, contemporary issues like what is the impact of COVID-19? And you can delve into more detail uh, in the activity that accompanies uh, this lecture. But you can see from the BBC News article on the right, uh, the BBC reporting that this is a humanitarian crisis, or it has been a humanitarian crisis, the volume of seafarers who have been stuck at sea during this pandemic, unable to disembark uh, from their ships. So lots of interesting avenues to take this further and to delve into those themes of, of human geographies, of shipping, globalisation, trade, and how that intersects with things like uh, a global pandemic. So if, just to offer some brief conclusions then, if we revisit this map, hopefully we've chipped away uh, at this inbuilt assumption in these representations that this blue space is empty, that it's, that it's disembodied, that it has no human geography to it. Because as we've seen, it's a profoundly human space. It's one that is occupied by over 1.5 million people um, at any given time, keeping our economy moving and keeping that process of globalisation uh, underway. So just to um, conclude then, we can think about, um, I guess, this process of kind of demand and supply driving the global shipping industry. So our demand for products and uh, for different commodities keeps this process moving. And it's really important as a result of this to think about uh, this process of globalisation and the processes of shipping and of trade as really connected to our everyday lives in ways that we don't really think of. Again, reminding you of that fact that 90 to 96% of all the things that are sitting around you right now have travelled through uh, the sea and have travelled through the labour of seafarers to get to you. And as we've touched upon, this is not a disembodied process. This has profound kind of human geographies uh, to it. And this process of circulation, this process of efficiency, of an efficient global economy has really profound impacts on those tasks with moving goods through the oceans. And perhaps when we're thinking through those questions of fair trade, maybe these are actors and these are processes that we should also be incorporating into our definitions. And just to end there, it's important to understand the ocean as a space of lived experience and not just this black, blank, sorry, empty blue space to be crossed as quickly as possible for profit. So I'm going to um, finish there. Um, and just to remind you that there's lots of resources uh, on our teacher hub um, and you can find the web address uh, just there. And you'll also find a summary of this lecture um, and an activity sheet as well to take your learning further.